In this video, we will learn about aliphatic substitution chemistry. Uh, these are commonly known as SN1 and SN2 reactions. And the word aliphatic refers to any sort of organic molecule that is not aromatic. And so I typically think of aliphatic as meaning the same thing as the word kind of alkane or alkyl. So substitution can take place if there's an sp3 carbon, or really any other atom that's sp3, that has a leaving group attached to it, which makes that carbon or other atom electrophilic. So for example here, I have a nucleophile that can react with this carbon, where the electrophile is really, we can think of as a carbon atom, or really the sigma star orbital from carbon to bromine as the electrophilic molecular orbital. Overall, doing a substitution where this group has substituted the place of the bromine, kicking out the bromide leaving group, and forming a new product here. There are two main mechanisms by which this reaction can take place. And so what we'll do is to go through these two mechanisms. I'm going to go through them as if those mechanisms are being used to explain this reaction up here. But to be clear, I'm not saying that one or the other mechanism is necessarily the correct mechanism for the reaction shown up here. Right? And so this is a relatively important idea, which is that, again, we have two possible mechanisms for explaining this reaction. We're going to just talk about these mechanisms generically before thinking about how to decide between those mechanisms. So in one possibility, the substitution can take place overall by having the leaving group first leave on its own spontaneously. And this is called an SN1 reaction. Let's look at this mechanism. So again, in the first step, the leaving group is going to leave first. So that's spontaneously going to leave. That gets us to a bromide and the carbocation intermediate. Naturally, this should be relatively unstable compared to the neutral molecule. So this is our going up in energy step to form an unstable intermediate. Once that intermediate is formed, then we should expect that an attack of a nucleophile to that positive charge should be relatively favorable and downhill, getting us to the product here. And so again, we have two steps. The first step is going to be the slow one. And another word that chemists like to use is that this is the rate determining step. So if we were to sit there and experimentally measure how fast this reaction was taking place, what we would measure is that the disappearance of the alkyl bromide and the formation of the ether would proceed at a rate that we can really essentially say is the same as the rate of this reaction right here. And so naturally, the second step is our fast step, which does not show up in the overall rate of the reaction that's measured experimentally. So again, when we do the experiment, we see an overall reaction we measure looks like this, and we see a rate that is related to this slow step here. How this shows up in the math is that we have rate laws, and the rate law for this reaction would have only one reactant in it. So the concentration of the alkyl bromide is the only thing that will affect how fast this reaction will take place. This is a unimolecular rate law because there's only one reactant in the rate law. That's why we call this an SN1. This is substitution, nucleophilic, unimolecular. The other mechanism by which these substitutions occur is the SN2 reaction. And in an SN2 reaction, what we get is that these two steps happen simultaneously. So the nucleophilic attack and the departure of the leaving group take place at the same time. So the mechanism is relatively simple to draw. So we have our nucleophile that's going to attack our electrophile. That's going to simultaneously lead to the leaving group leaving, getting us to the product and, of course, the bromide leaving group. So what we have here now is a rate that is going to depend on both the concentration of the nucleophile and the electrophile. And so this is going to be a bimolecular rate law. And so that's where the 2 here comes from in SN2. It's very easy for people learning this for the first time to get mixed up because they think of the number of steps as relating to this number here. That's not the case. This number is, again, referring to the number of components in the rate law. So if we're thinking about these two types of mechanisms, uh, hopefully we can understand that we want to think about, in the SN1 case, the stability of the carbocation intermediate because the slow step, that rate, is going to depend on how easy it is to form this carbocation. While for the SN2 reaction, what we're going to think about is the stability of the transition state, uh, because that's the hill we have to climb. So what we're thinking about then is 
at the point where we kind of have this half-formed bond between nucleophile and the electrophilic carbon, and the half-broken bond between the carbon and the leaving group here. And so the stability of this species is determining the rate of the SN2 reaction. So we'll spend a little bit of time here on SN1 reactions specifically. So again, the carbocation intermediate stability is what determines the rate of SN1. And so to give you a sense of what that means, this is a ranking of rates that were measured experimentally for the reaction of ethanol as a nucleophile with a number of different alkyl chlorides. And so the benchmark for this particular set of experiments was set to have the allyl chloride be the one. And from there, what we see is that um, the tertiary carbocation that would be formed for this alkyl chloride that is more stable than one primary carbocation stabilized by resonance. So here you get a thousand times faster reaction rate. If you have both the fact that it's a tertiary carbocation and the resonance that's possible here, then you get even more stabilization. And then finally, if you can have electron pair donation in terms of resonance into that empty positive charge right there, then you get even more rate enhancement. So this is 10 to the 12 times faster than the allyl chloride. On the other side, if the carbon with the leaving group attached has less substitution, so in this case secondary or primary, then the rate of the reaction will decrease. And I should be specific to say the rate of the SN1 reaction will decrease because the stability of that carbocation is going to be very low, and so it's very hard to form those carbocations. We want to be a little bit careful here and understand that the rate of the SN1 is decreasing, not the rate of substitution. So it might be possible for substitution to take place between ethanol and these two electrophiles, but it may not be likely for it to go through an SN1 mechanism. As with all reactions that go through carbocation intermediates, it's important to remember that carbocation rearrangements are possible. So for example, if we take this alcohol and react it under HBr conditions, what we end up getting is a substitution of the bromide for the alcohol here. And that substitution appears to take place at a different carbon. So let me just walk through this mechanism just to make sure we're all on the same page of what's going on here. So under acidic conditions, alcohols will get protonated. Once they're protonated, then they become decent leaving groups as protonated alcohols because they can leave as a water molecule. The SN1 reaction tells us that we need this to leave spontaneously on its own to get us to the carbocation intermediate. This carbocation intermediate then is liable to rearrange because we can get to a rearranged intermediate with tertiary carbocation in it. So the rearrangement looks like that, where now we had that new orange hydrogen showing up and the original black hydrogen that was there. At this point then, the actual attack of the nucleophile can take place, getting us to the observed tertiary alkyl bromide. And finally, since we're dealing with carbocation intermediates, we should expect that there's no mechanistic stereoselectivity going on, and that's indeed the case. SN1 reactions will tend to produce a racemic mixture of products. Now let's look at SN2 reactions. So same idea here, I'm giving a set of relative rates, this time between these alkyl chlorides and iodide as a nucleophile. So what I'm showing you here now is the relative ranking is set to the primary alkyl chloride as the one. Um, as we get more and more substituted at that carbon, the rate decreases to the point that it's essentially zero here for the terputyl chloride. And I should be a little bit careful in saying zero. It's zero because another type of reaction happens so much faster than SN2 that we don't even see the SN2. As we go to the right here, uh, it looks like having this pi bond, making this an allyl chloride, increases reaction rates. Being less substituted also increases reaction rates. And finally, it looks like being close to a carbonyl further increases reaction rates. And so let's go through and justify those observations. So the first factor that is the most important is that the reaction rate is going to be affected by any sterics, and specifically sterics that make the transition state harder or easier to achieve. So here I have two examples. This is the CH3 methyl chloride case corresponding to this 
reaction right here. And so the transition state looks like this, where the nucleophile has formed half of a bond, and the leaving group has broken half of the bond. So we get this kind of a, what looks like a carbon with five bonds around it, but if we remember these are both half bonds, then this is okay. This transition state should be lower in energy than the analogous one where instead of hydrogens, there are methyl groups here. So this is the terp-butyl chloride here. So that's this reaction right here. Because there's five groups trying to organize around a carbon and three of those groups are fairly large methyl groups, this transition state is very sterically difficult to make. It's very high in energy. That's why we get essentially no significant rate of SN2 reaction. A second factor is that conjugation can also serve to stabilize the transition state and make reactions go faster. So here I'm comparing just a primary alkyl chloride against the allyl chloride, which is this set of reaction right here. I want to show you what this looks like uh, from the orbital perspective. So uh, pull up a model here. Uh, this is a similar reaction. In this case, the model is showing you a bromide nucleophile reacting with methyl chloride. So let me run through this animation here. Um, what you should see is that the nucleophile attacks, and at some point there is this transition state right here, where neither the nucleophile or, or the leaving group are completely bonded to the carbon atom. And what you see is that the central carbon atom has become very planarized, almost like it's a carbocation, right? It's not because it has eight electrons, um, but it kind of looks like it because it's flat. Um, as the reaction proceeds, then we form the new bond between the nucleophile and the carbon, and then the leaving group has left. Now I want to pull up the orbitals that we're supposed to think about when we're looking at this reaction. Um, so let me reset my animation here. So what we're going to be looking at is that in the electrophile, we'll have this orbital. So this is kind of related to that sigma star antibonding orbital. And then on the nucleophile side, we'll just have a lone pair on bromine, which is in a p atomic orbital on bromine. So in our animation then, what we're getting is kind of this process, and what you're seeing is that at the transition state, right here when that carbon in the middle is totally flat, is might be a little hard to see, but the central carbon has essentially what looks like a p orbital on it, which makes sense because it's planar, kind of has that carbocation-like appearance to it. As the reaction continues, then we get our new bond, and then we just get the kind of opposite outcome of an isolated p orbital on chlorine and the new sigma bond uh, between the carbon and the bromine. For the reaction between the allyl chloride and the iodide here, what we're getting is that in the transition state, this orbital that we just saw um, at that planarized carbon, that is able to actually conjugate with the pi bond that's nearby. So these two p orbitals here are correlating to the pi bond that I'm showing there. And that little bit of conjugation here serves to stabilize the transition state enough to make it overall lower in energy, leading to a faster reaction rate. All right, I've pulled up another model of an SN2 reaction, this time on an allyl chloride. Uh, the nucleophile is not an iodide, but rather an SH- nucleophile, or a thiolate. So let me just show you this animation first without any orbitals on it. So here is that SN2 process. Uh, you'll notice there's a bit of conformational change that's taking place, but overall it's still the same SN2 reaction. Now let me pull up the orbitals that are involved. So that's the electrophile. Um, that's the pi bond. That's on the pi bond of the allyl group. And there's the nucleophile. So now let me run my reaction forward and let's get to the transition state. That looks like approximately here. And so what you'll see is that that purple and blue uh, pi bond is mixing a bit with that planarized carbon. So there is a bit of conjugation that's taking place and that orbital mixing serves to stabilize this intermediate, which thus makes it a faster SN2 reaction than if there was not this level of stabilization. A third factor is that on top of all that, uh, the electrophile can be destabilized by electron withdrawing groups, which also do the second thing of stabilizing the negative charge in the transition state. And so the big place that we observe that happening is when there is a carbonyl, and next to the carbonyl, there is the leaving group on a chlorine. And so what we're getting is, again, two things. So one is that the reactant is destabilized because we already have some amount of 
positive charge here that makes the electrophilicity of that carbon even greater. The second thing is that in the transition state, because we're overall going to be negatively charged, because there's a nucleophile attacking, this electron withdrawing is going to stabilize the negative charge of the transition state. And so overall, there's two things happening here. One is the reactant destabilization. The second is transition state stabilization. Both of those increase the rate of the reaction by lowering the barrier to the reaction. That's why a molecule like this one is going to react much faster than either a primary alkyl chloride or an allyl chloride. A fourth important consideration for SN2 reactions is that the stronger the nucleophile is, the faster the SN2 reaction will go. And so if we're looking at this, then the pattern we'll see is that in general, uh, stronger nucleophiles are going to also be very strong bases. And so we can construct a nucleophilicity scale that looks something like what I've shown you here, uh, which follows trends that work also for determining the strength of a base. A second important factor is that the nucleophile in an SN2 reaction is almost always negatively charged. And that means that the nucleophile is actually coming with a counter cation to balance the charge out. And it turns out the strength of interaction between those two ions can actually lead to a difference in reactivity of the nucleophile itself. And so let me show you this example here. Um, so again, what we're thinking about is we have a negatively charged nucleophile and a cation that's balancing the charge. How closely or tightly this cation is bound to the negative charge will influence how available the nucleophile is then to react with the electrophile. And so here's the experimental data. For this reaction, what we see is that when the metal is lithium, so that's a small cation, what we're getting is that that's our relative rate of one. And as we increase the size of our cation to be more and more different from the carbon atom here, uh, we get faster and faster rates because, again, these ions are less and less tightly bound. And so a way to think about this is that the nucleophile is more available to react. And so then it's going to react much more quickly. Sterics are extremely important. Um, the sterics of the nucleophile can significantly reduce nucleophilicity. So for example, if I look at the terp-butoxide here, this is almost not possible to do SN2 with. That's how large this terp-butyl group is. That's in contrast, of course, to ethoxide, which doesn't have that same steric hindrance, and that undergoes very fast SN2 with the same electrophile. A final consideration for SN2 reactions is that the SN2 reaction leads to what's called an inversion of stereochemistry. Um, this happens because the reaction is concerted in that the leaving group leaves at the same time the nucleophile adds. So when I think about this, what I'm thinking about is this kind of a, I think of it as like an um umbrella inverting. So if you keep your eye in the animation on the three hydrogens, I'll highlight right there, um, what you see is they kind of invert. Right? So what that means is that for the carbon, if we're doing our CIP rules, the groups will go from being clockwise to counterclockwise because we are uh, inverting the relative orientations with respect to the lowest priority group. And so we do want to be careful because the inversion of stereochemistry doesn't mean that it's 100% of the time going to go from R to S or S to R. That's usually the case. Uh, but that depends a little bit on whether the new incoming group is going to be the same level of priority as the one that's leaving relative to everything else. So uh, I think of it more like if my initial leaving group is a wedge, I invert the nucleophile to be a hash. And that's the level of inversion that I'm going to assume. Finally, we should think about some considerations for both SN1 and SN2 reactions. So these are factors that affect both of these reactions. Um, so what we'll see is that better leaving groups will increase the rate of both SN1 and SN2. And this should make sense because uh, no matter what, the rate determining step is going to involve the leaving group leaving. So in general, good leaving groups are going to be weak bases. And a good benchmark is that the pKa of the conjugate acid of the leaving group is less than 2. And so, for example, iodide is a great leaving group, a little bit better than bromide, which is on the same level as these right here. This is called a sulfonate and that's going to be a lot better than chloride, and that's going to be way better than fluoride. In fact, we almost never see fluoride as a leaving group in an SN2 reaction. So along those lines, um, what we'll see is that in SN2 and SN1 reactions, we need 
better leaving groups than we would have in a carbonyl substitution. And this kind of makes sense again, because in carbonyl substitution, the hard part is for the nucleophile to add to the carbonyl, rather than SN1 and SN2 reactions, where the hard part is making sure our leaving group leaves. And so things like a hydroxide OH- minus will not be seen as a leaving group in an SN1 or SN2 reaction. Same goes for acetate, and definitely the same goes for amide. So going back to the sulfonates up here, uh, sulfonates are very important leaving groups in SN1, SN2 uh, type of chemistry uh, because they can be easily synthesized from alcohols. And so the reaction looks like this, where I take any alcohol, react it with a sulfonyl chloride in the presence of some weak base, and that'll get me to the sulfonate, uh, where the sulfonate refers to SO3R. Mechanism for the reaction looks like so. Um, this is a simplified version. It turns out there's some complexities involved depending on the identity of the R group. Uh, but for now, we'll assume this is what's going on, which is an SN2 at the sulfur to get you to this intermediate, and then the deprotonation to get you to the sulfonate. Of the sulfonates, these are the most common. Uh, so we'll see something abbreviated OTF, or triflate, which is spelled like so. Um, we'll see OMS, so that's a methyl group on the sulfonate here. So that's mesylate. And the last one, the OTS, the TS refers to the toluene sulfonate here. And this is tosylate. So whenever you see these, these are definitely going to be leaving groups in your reactant molecule. So beyond these factors, which are all kind of confined to the reactants themselves, we also have to think about external factors of the reaction conditions. And so the most important one is the solvent that the reaction is conducted in. Um, the purpose of solvents are to stabilize or destabilize the reactants and or the transition states in a way that it increases the rate of the reaction that you want. The first kind of solvent we'll look at is the polar protic solvent. Um, so the word protic means that there's protons available for hydrogen bonding. And what's important is that in these polar protic solvents, there's a very strong dipole here that gets us to partial negative on oxygen, partial positive on hydrogen. And because of that, this molecule of methanol or other similar molecule of solvent is very good at stabilizing um, both the positive and negative charges that you might find in a reaction mixture. So let's take, for example, sodium methoxide dissolved in methanol. Here I have the sodium cation, methoxide anion, and I can kind of imagine my solvent molecules organized like so around those two ions in a way that all the partial positives are close to formal or partial negatives and vice versa. This type of arrangement will actually serve to stabilize this nucleophile, and so that actually makes the nucleophile less reactive. So if we wanted to increase the energy of our nucleophile and make it more reactive, we would move to polar aprotic solvents. Um, aprotic solvents don't have hydrogens available for hydrogen bonding. So here's a couple examples. And so because of that, then, they are not very good at providing any source of kind of partial positive stabilization. Uh, the reason for this is if I go through and look at these two molecules and look at the dipoles that are being formed, what I get is that the partial negative dip side of the dipole is much more sterically accessible than the partial positive side. And so that means that these solvents are a really good source of partial negative stabilization, but not very good source of partial positive stabilization. And partial positive stabilization is what you would need to stabilize something with a negative charge on it. So that's a long-winded way to say that these solvents do not do a good job of stabilizing negative charge, leading nucleophiles to usually be more nucleophilic compared to when they're dissolved in protic solvents. Finally, the third category of solvent is the nonpolar solvents, where the word nonpolar is a bit of a misnomer. We just mean really less polar than other solvents. Um, and these solvents are not able to provide very much polar stabilization at all. And so because of that, they just generally are going to increase the energy of anything that has a charge on it. And so even though it increases the energy of our charged transition states and intermediates, it's also increasing the energy of our charged reactants. And so maybe overall, the energy barriers may not change too much. 
Some examples of these would be hexane, which is very nonpolar, or dichloromethane, which has a small dipole to it. Um, in both of these cases, the, the SN2 reactions are not impossible. They'll be a little bit faster than dichloromethane than they are in hexane, and they will still be faster in polar solvents than they are in nonpolar solvents. So that was a look at substitution chemistry taking place at sp3 atoms. So that was a look at substitution chemistry taking place at sp3 atoms. We looked a lot at various different factors that can affect SN1 and SN2 rates. And it's important to remember that all of these different concepts are always tied back to affecting the rate of the reaction and really the rate of an SN1 reaction relative to an SN2 reaction.